What's going on, everybody? Hey, listen, before we continue in this episode, have you checked to see if you've subscribed yet? You need to subscribe. Come on. If you like these videos and you're enjoying what you're watching, then it's about time that you go ahead and subscribe. Maybe you haven't noticed yet. Check now. Did you? No? All right, go ahead. Hit that notification button. Subscribe. It helps YouTube to know that you like our content. All right, see you on the next one. Peace. Hey, what's going on, everybody? You made it back to another It Starts With Me, which means it is Wednesday at 1230 Eastern, and I'm glad to have you here. We got an awesome, awesome guy that's coming in to speak with us today, Richard Flint. He's in charge. He's the CEO and chairman of Flint Incorporated, and he, he hails out of Virginia and lives out here in Florida just like me. I came from Virginia and now I'm down here in Florida. So this is gonna be exciting. He's gonna bring a lot of uh, knowledge, wisdom, and he also uh, is here to bring a little bit of the spirit with him as well. So glad to have him on board. First off, let's talk about our shows. As I said before, every single Wednesday, it starts with me. It's here and it is, this podcast is designed to explore the differences and the transitional phenomena inside of individuals everywhere, right? And to find out what it is that makes them tick and how they got from there to here. And I think that's a really important phenomenon, right? Because time and chance plays an important factor on how we make or when we make our decisions, you know? And what ends up happening is, is that sometimes we sit back and we allow decisions to pass on before us. And other times we have enough gusto inside of us to bear the risk of whatever it may be and to make a choice that isn't always so easy to make. And because of that, the fruits of our labor are great and plenteous. So we love to explore these types of stories and we're looking forward to hearing one from Richard on today. Also, be advised, on every single Friday, we have the Community Beacon where myself and the co-host Michael Seville are here to bring forth the different light of understanding that we have as a beacon to the community and also the lessons that have shined on us. We enjoy sharing these things. This month, we have a really uh, special, special uh, type of month coming up, and we're hoping and, and, and asking that you all would just join in and be a part of this great, great, great month, because what we want to do is we want to dive in really deep and start to explore, you know, the coming of age. So you're going to have a lot of your young, your young people and your 20-year-olds you know, we want you all to really engage into this. And we're looking for some of the older crowd to come in and engage, you know, being my age or something like that, to also give feedback as we talk about the coming of age. We also have some special guests on the community beacon that should be showing up. All right. So we'll give you those names a little bit later on in time. Lastly, on every single Monday at nine o'clock p.m., what it takes Every single Monday, Michael Seville, the co-host of Community Beacon, is bringing what it takes to be successful. He is the business model. He is the real estate king, and he is a great friend and supporter. I love him dearly. So please, please, please show up for Michael Seville's uh, show, whatever, what it takes. And that's going to be airing on his YouTube channel or on his Facebook. Everything else, you can catch it on the Tenacity Foundation YouTube, or you can check us out on wherever you stream your podcast. Anyway, at this time, let's move on forward and let's start talking about Richard Flint. He is the CSP, all right? Richard Flint, CSP, is the chairman and CEO of Flint Incorporated, a company specializing in the training and development of individuals, companies, and associations. He has had the opportunity to address people in talks and seminars throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, and speaks to both corporate and private audiences. As a keynote speaker, 
and seminar leader. He addresses more than 200,000 people each year. Richard has studied, researched, written, and spoken for 35 years in his field of expertise, human behavior and development. Through his programs in business, leadership, management, customer service, sales, ethics, motivation, organization, and personal relationships, he has made appearances on over 100 radio and TV shows, as well as hosting his acclaimed podcast, Let's Talk Human Behavior. He has also written 19 books and produced more than 100 plus audio and video learning programs, including being a finalist for the top self-help book of 2005. Without further ado, let's welcome Richard Flint to the program. Hey, Joe, it is really, really uh, exciting for me to be here with you and to have this opportunity to share presence because I think that's what we do every day of our life. We share presence with people. And it's more than just being there. Uh, just sometimes we're there, but we're not present. And the power of life is being able to share presence with people. So I'm excited to be with you today. I mean, um, I've had to chase you from Virginia to Florida um, to find you. And I'm not sure which one of the two of us is chasing whom, but we found each other. And thank you for this invite today. Oh, man, Richard, uh, you know, it's my pleasure. And I definitely thank you. I don't know if it, I think that it may have been me chasing you. Maybe that's what the case was. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you've got quite the experience and quite the uh, quite the years of work ethics and also teaching. And I'm definitely grateful for what you've been doing in the community. And I love the way that you just opened up the conversation with presence, you know, presence is really important, you know, and in order for us to obtain clarity, I definitely think that we have to be present, you know, so uh, clarity is a is a really important thing. So I'm just grateful to have you here, buddy. Yeah, Joel, I'm excited to be here. And, you know, the, the top three things in my life right now, and uh, I think that life is uh, is an evolution. And for those of us who want to grow, and people ask me all the time, what percentage of people do you think ever use anything you teach? 2%. Mm. 2%. And when I started this journey 35 years ago, I made a promise to myself, I made a promise to God that I would spend every day of my life with every opportunity he gave me. Uh, to try to help people to achieve three things, to be better. And Joel, I don't know if you see this as much as I see it, but most people are better at talking about what they're going to do than actually doing it. Yeah. Um, if you ask anyone who's ever said in my presence uh, and you ask them, what do you remember about this guy? They'll tell you three words, behavior, never, lies and that the essence of truth is not what people say it's what they do and i learned when i was in the world of running uh, a counseling center most people want honesty as long as it's not honest <laughs> and if you and i and your listeners can't handle honesty we can't ever get better and i my writings my research and everything is about helping people to come to the place where they get honest about what they want for their life. And, you know, if you don't want to improve, stop talking about it because you're just lying to yourself and everybody else. But if you want to improve, I'm going to tell you something, and you know this, you've, you've, you've walked the walk. There's a price tag to improvement because better is not something that just happens. The second thing that I promised that I wanted for people is I want people to be smarter. And I, I, I'm not talking as much about intellect as I am common sense. You know, you and I build our life on one of two foundations. And if those who are your audience can think of a third foundation for life, uh, I'd love for them to share it with me. Because in all my years, I've only found two foundations that people can build their life on. The first one is belief 
trust and faith. And the second one is worry, doubt, and uncertainty. And you and I cannot get stronger if we live in a world where we doubt ourselves, we worry about everything, and uncertainty rules us. You and I can only get stronger when we live in a world where we believe in ourselves, we trust ourselves, and we have the faith to turn the unknown into adventure. And, and when we can do that, then we learn the difference between living inside out and outside in. And, and Joel, I'll just say this openly to you. I think one of the greatest challenges in our society here in the United States today is the fact that we are being pushed to live from the outside and live in a world where doubt, worry, and uncertainty is thrown at us every day. If I can trap you in that world, I can own you emotionally. And what I'm seeing today is that people are reacting because they're living outside in. But if, if I can build my life based on my belief, my trust, and my faith, and I can live from the inside out, we can have what I think is one of the things that God put us on this earth to have, that we can have a positive presence that is present when we're not present. And I think that's the most powerful thing that can be said about any human, is that you have that positive presence that is present when you're not present. You know, I know it's true in my life. I know it's true in the life of your listeners and probably even true with you. That during our lifetime, there are people who have passed through our life, may not even be alive today, but they've had an impact on the development of whom we are today. And they still live within us. And that's presence. That's presence. And, and then the third thing I want for people is I promised God that I would help people find the pathway to be the original that he put them on this earth to be. You know, my, my top three philosophies of my 16 philosophies in life that I live by, number one is this, I am an original. God didn't put me on this earth to be Joel. God put me on this earth to be Richard. And he gave me unique skills and unique talents. And, and, and these are what I have to develop. And every year I take on 10 people and I am their, their private mentor, not coach. There's a difference between a mentor and a coach. But I am their, their private mentor for one year of their life. And what we work on is we help them to become comfortable to be the original and to understand the power to living from the inside out. As I study the scriptures, one of the things that I see as a constant theme uh, that Christ had as he walked, the, the, walked this earth is to help people understand you're not here by accident, you're here with a purpose. And that purpose is not to get lost in the midst of people, but to stand in the midst of people with a presence that allows people to see your difference. And that only happens when you and I understand the difference between living outside in, where I allow the world to define me, and living inside out, where I find my uniqueness, and I find my originality, and I can be authentic. But to do that, you got to be strong. <laughs> I mean, the, the world doesn't like authentic people. The world doesn't like people who are strong. The world doesn't like people who know how to live from the inside out because you can't control them. But again, there's a price tag to learning to live from the inside out. I have a little note that sits in front of me every morning. It's at three different places in my house here. And there's just one simple statement on there. Somebody is going to need me today. And that creates my ministry. That creates my purpose. Is for me to be prepared from the inside out. So that every day as I walk in the midst of this world. 
I look for the people who are going to need me today. And I'll tell you something. There are days when I'm the one who needs me. <laughs> there are days when I just need to have the quiet time. Uh, I don't know if it's true about your life, but sometimes life can get too noisy. And sometimes we, we need to be able to just find that solitude. You know, it's always interesting to me that when Christ was on this earth and he walked among the people, he always found time to disappear and find that quiet time. And it's in that quiet time that you and I are strong. But, you know, helping people to become better, helping people to become smarter, helping people to accept their originality. It drives me every single day of my life. Hmm. That's powerful. That's powerful. And there's a lot of stuff that you said in there. Uh, I mean, I agree with, I agree with what you're saying there, Richard, you know, and I definitely appreciate it because there's so much into this, you know, I definitely appreciate the the three the top three things that you made the promise out to you know um, to be better to be smarter and to find um to, to find the pathway to help people find the pathway to become their original as intended by god and i still i i love that because um you're talking about helping people become free you know and and freedom truly starts on the inside not on the outside so I, I think this is powerful. What was it that inspired you to go down? I mean, I've got a lot of things that I want to discuss with you, but what was it that inspired you to go down this pathway? Well, Joel, in my background, uh, I was born in New Orleans. Um, I don't know anything about my, my natural father. The only thing I knew about, and I have known about my real mother is that she was a prostitute in New Orleans. And I was the result of a one night stand she had with some guy. And when I was born, she didn't want me. So I, when I was about uh, two, three weeks old, I was adopted into a family. And I was adopted because my dad wanted a son. He didn't, he, he didn't have one. And my mother didn't want me. My adopted mother didn't want me. And she made that clear to me. And as far back as I can go in my memory, Joel, there were three things that my mother told me every day. You're the stupidest kid I've ever met in my life. You'll never amount to anything in life. And my greatest day will be the day when you're no longer in my house. So when I was 16 years of age, I was handed a suitcase and was left on a street corner. And everything that I have done with my life has been about rising above what I was programmed with. Parents can program children. And one of the things we're challenged with today is that we don't have a lot of parents. We have adult children who live in what we is not a home, it's a house. And we're seeing, we are seeing the results of that today. But I, I lived for several years trying to prove to my mother she was wrong. And when I was a sophomore in college, I made the decision I had to go back and confront my parents because I believe anything you don't confront, you validate. And when I went back to see my mom and dad and I walked into the house, my mother took one look at me, picked up her purse, took out her car keys, walked out the back door, got in her car and drove off. And I never saw her again. But what she did that day, Joel, is she freed me to understanding I don't have to live my life to prove myself to anyone. In the world of doing counseling, so many people who come to me, in the world of working as a mentor, so many people come to me, in the world of reaching out and touching lives, so many people come to me. And the biggest issue in their life is that they've never been taught how to be authentic. So they live their life from the outside in every day, looking at people and going, love me, see me, find me. And yet they've never found their self. And so when I think about what I do with my life, this, this is my ministry. This is what God's put me on this earth to do. And I'm serious about my little statement. 
somebody today is going to need me. The other day, it was a young salesman that came to my front door and he was there to try to sell me pest control. I ended up giving him a copy of my book, I Need a Life. And uh, I got a call from him back and he said, thank you for the book because it's opened me up to see things that I didn't see about myself. And every day as we grow, one of the real tests of growth is being available to the people who today need us. Hmm. Wow. Uh, Richard, tell me something, you know, because this is that, that's a heavy story right there. And everybody is not able to, you know, develop like you did. And, you know, I, I guess it's at the age of 16 years old when your mother leaves out of your uh, out of your your life. And today, you know, or at some point in time, post uh, that year, you you actually began to realize what has happened, your ability to process and to move beyond that those circumstances what was it exactly you know like what was the feeling that you had in that moment when you know she's like i mean she gives you three things that are horrible you know you're stupid you won't amount to anything and the greatest day is going to be when you leave my life that feeling what was it that you carried i suppose it's three questions one what was it that you were feeling prior to or during while you're going through and then the second one is what was it that uh, that you felt or what was it that happened that caused you to realize I'm greater than this and then of course the third one is what did you do once you realized that well when I was 15 my adopted mother told me if I was to live in her house I had to pay her room and board so I got a job at a local IGA grocery store in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And I would work till nine o'clock each night and my dad would come pick me up. And I, I can remember this like it was yesterday, Joel. I'd been 16 for two weeks. And I called my dad to come get me. He pulled up in front of the grocery store. And he opened the car door, which he never did. And he stepped out the car and there was just, just this fear that went through me. And when he stepped behind the car, and he stepped into the street light, I knew instantly what was happening because my dad was carrying a suitcase. And he sat over and set, he walked over, set the suitcase down beside me and told me, Richard, I don't agree with this, this, but your mother has decided you can't live in this house anymore. And he gave me a hug and I'll, I'll never forget hearing the emotions that were going through him. And he said, son, I don't want you to ever forget. I love you very much, but I don't know what to do. And with that, he turned and he actually didn't walk back to the car. He ran back to the car. He got in the car and he, he drove off. And next memory I have, Joel, is a guy grabbing me by the back of the neck and screaming at me, get out of the street, because I'm standing in the street watching my dad drive away. And my feelings was, if you love me, how can you let this happen? And I stood there for a while and finally determined you can't spend your life standing on a street corner. So I went to the hotel Ardmore and I checked in and they gave me a, a key to a room because I had cash. And I went up to the sixth floor. I walked in, never turned the lights on, dropped the suitcase, walked across the room, opened the window and crawled out and sat on the ledge. And on that ledge, I, I fought with myself. Do you live or do you die? I, I learned that night that the only reason a person can ever commit suicide is if they figure out that if I'm not here, no one's going to miss me. And on that ledge, I made a decision. I am not going to let my mother have this victory in my life. And from that moment on, God put four men in my life who came at me at very important times. One was my two friends, uh, father, who I called and the next morning he spent three hours with me, finally asking me, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm not going back. So he helped me find a room in the, uh, with a, a lady who was the editor of the daily newspaper in town. And I, I paid her $5 a week to live in her house. And every day I'd go to school, I'd go to football practice, I'd go to that IJ store, 
I'd come home, I'd sit at the dining room table, do my homework, because I didn't want to go to bed. Because I knew that when I walked into that bedroom, I was going to cry myself to sleep. Because I, another thing that I live by is that the number one thing a human life wants to know is that they matter. And then from there, God put three other men in my life that kept challenging me. And one of the things that I see missing in life today is some people don't have a mentor in their life, someone to challenge them. They have people who want to direct them. They have people who want to own them. They have people who want to tell them what to do. But we don't need those people. We need people who care enough about us that they challenge us, not try to control us. I agree. And that really is what it comes down to, right? You know, um, the programming inside of our lives um, teaches us that we ought to be controlled because we don't know what to do. We don't know which way to go. And I, I feel as if it's my moral responsibility for me and for my children that I don't control the outcome of every single thing that they do. I mean, there are certain things that I desire to do because I want to protect them from making, um, when they're making certain decisions. But my ideal goal with my children is to provide them the construct of how to think and how to think appropriately to weigh out options and to understand the rationale between um, uh, values, morals, and to not count themselves down, but to count themselves up so that they can better be prepared with judgment and wisdom and knowledge and understanding to make the most appropriate decision and to be whatever they desire to be, even if in the essence of it, they decide to do something that, you know, maybe I have pre-programmed in my own mind, you know, my daughter will be such and such, my son will be such and such. I just want them to truly be free and to have freedom in mind. You know, you talk about Christ, you know, and one scripture says that God have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of joy, and of a sound mind. And that means a lot to me. It means so much to me because if that's the type of power that's been passed down from God to me, then why would I want anything different from my children? Yeah, you know, uh, Joel, I, I think in parenthood, I, I think there are, are four different phases. I think when a child is young, our role is to protect them. I think when they get to a certain age, our role is to prepare them. And I think the next step is our role is there to be a leader. And then as they, they get to young adulthood, our role is there to guide them. Yes. Uh, we're not there to be a script writer for kids. You have no idea. Uh, when I was on the church staff, you have no idea how many parents would bring their kids to me, wanting me to convince their kid that the parent was right about what they wanted this child to be. And you, you can't, God gave every one of us a unique personality. Uh, I am not like you, and I'm thankful that I'm not like you, but I am, I'm like me, and that's what I want to be. I want to be authentic. And, you know, we just finished uh, a four part series that we've been, we did during the month, we've done during the month of June. It's on our podcast, uh, Let's Talk Human Behavior, about the hurrying of children. Because I think we're, to, we're taking away childhood from children today. Hmm. And my role is let a child be a child as long as they can be a child. All of this stuff today about transgender, all of this stuff that we're talking about today is just about presenting a young life with something they can't understand and they're not ready for. And who gives us the right to play God in the life of children? We don't have the right. But yet our society today seems to be bent on saying, we know what's better for your kids than you do. And I'm sorry, that's wrong. Yeah, 100% is wrong. 100% is wrong. That's a powerful statement. You know, uh, and 
And you know, I feel as if I want to share this little piece right there because you brought something that just kind of like bubbled up and I feel like it just should be shared, at least for my sake, you know, because this this whole movement, um, it had it had a certain type of effect. And I felt as if there was some part of this that this movement came across and it was in comparison to a movement that happened years back, decades back, civil rights, as a matter of fact. And when this movement of, you know, the LGBTQ community, it was a standing, a standing block, you know, and it stood on the civil rights movement. And I know that there's been a lot of hurt to that community. The thing that I, I concerned that concerned me, and the thing that really touched my heart was, as a, as a, as a black man, you know, um, that has heard all of the stories from my parents, you know, and my grandparents of slavery, as well as you know few generations back my family on both sides were slaves you know bought and sold raped you know and also with my parents having been and my grandparents having been you know underneath certain circumstances and participating in marches and then my parents you know having been uh, mistreated in the uh, business world and then myself having been mistreated in, um, in my lifetime. And um, it just felt in some kind of way because the thing about this LGBTQ community is that they are people from all different nationalities and the comparison just did not seem like it was uh, equal. And I didn't feel like uh, that comparison should be laid on the backs of slaves. Um, not to say that every LGBT individual has made a choice. Maybe somebody inherited this. Maybe it was inside the bloodstream. It's not my argument, but there was absolutely no choice inside of the black Americans that were underneath slavery. And I didn't think that that should be something that qualified as, um, as, as their means for movement. And, uh, I don't mean to go too far off of the subject, but your conversation kind of made me feel like that it's necessary to insert that little piece uh, because this is a deep conversation. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, let me respond to you this way. I believe that all behavior has an agenda. When someone comes to me and says, Richard, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I'll look at them and tell them, you're lying to yourself. Because nothing that you and I do with our life, do we do without giving ourselves permission to do it. Everything I do, I have to give myself permission to do it. And as, as I, I look at our world today, and I, and I, I, and I concentrate on our country today, uh, I think there are three things that is an agenda. And Joel, behind every agenda is another agenda. And that background agenda, we're not privy to. But I think the background agenda today is to destroy three things. Take God out of the picture. I mean, so much of what we're watching today is to remove God and to do away with that statement in God we trust. And if we don't have God to believe in, to trust in, and have faith in, we're like a herd of lost sheep. Look at what happened when the children of Israel, whenever they just removed God, they wandered around for 40 years. I think the second thing that's the hidden agenda today is to destroy the family. Yeah, I, I think that there is an emphasis on this. And the way you destroy the family is take control of the kids. And so watch what's happening today in schools. Children are not being taught today. They are being programmed. 
And no teacher has the right to program a child. But you know, you take a child into that's in kindergarten all the way up to, I'm going to tell you through the sixth, seventh grade, they can be programmed. And that has to stop. That has to stop. But what they're doing, they know if they destroy the family, they destroy that which holds our country together, God and country. And I think if they can achieve those things, they achieve their ultimate agenda. And that's to kill the human spirit. You and I are people who, I feel this about you. You live from the inside out. I live from the inside out. But our society today is pushing everybody to live from the outside in. How much doubt do we have thrown at us today? Hmm. And the thing about doubt, Joe, is that you and I can't doubt without worrying. Doubt and worry always work together. And when those two come to the party, they bring their buddy with them. Uncertainty. That's right. And if I create a world of uncertainty because I don't have belief, trust, and faith, I give you my life in your hands. And that's what I see as the direction of our country right now, is that they're saying to us, you don't know how to live. So I'm going to take control of your life. And if we take God, family, and our right of a human spirit away from us, they own us. Hmm. <sighs> most powerful information i mean this is this is something else um richard you know i want to go back i'm gonna go back to um that second question that i asked you because based off of the tangent that we just went off on and your ability to navigate back into that same um that, that same uh questioning i think that the answering that second question is very appropriate now you know because you're standing there and you know um, in the middle of the street and you're pulled out of the street you know um, are you going to stand in the street forever you know and you're confronting yourself with pain misery sorrow frustration possible suicide all these things are going through your mind and you know in this moment in these however long it is how long was it as a matter of fact from 15 to what 16 17 you know was it six months was it two years you know of fighting off depression or whatever it was in your mind what were those um those things those three things you know or four things that um just gave you the life lesson that uh you could actually achieve greater and what was the motivator that made you do that every day well you know god promised us he'd never leave us alone and i think these gentlemen that god brought through my life it's four guys it's four gentlemen right yeah that god brought to my life to hug me mentally and emotionally we don't know how to hug today. I, I mean, when I look at Troy Howe, I, I mean, his kids were my two best friends. He hugged me emotionally. And he, he didn't push me or challenge me. He guided me with the questions he asked. When I look at Spencer Hayes, who was the president of the Southwestern, Southwestern Bible Company, which I sold Bibles door to door, Joel, for three summers. And I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in life. But that night when I went to that meeting with my roommate and everybody had left and I was starting to leave and Spencer came over and said, can I talk to you, young man? I just froze. He said, when are you going to stop running from yourself? This guy didn't know me from Adam. And I looked at him, I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're running. He said, when are you going to slow down and really find yourself? And then Clyde Irving was my sales manager. And there was a time when I was out there and I was knocking on 40 to 50 doors a day selling Bibles. And I called Clyde and I said, Clyde, I quit. I'm going home. He said, why? I said, because no one wants to talk to me. 
he says, is it them or is it you? And that was a powerful question at that moment in my life. And then a gentleman by the name of Bill Gold, that when I made the decision to leave the church staff and to pursue what I do with my life today, I asked everybody, who can I talk to? And they said, well, you talk to Bill Gold. And little did I know that um, <laughs> Joel, he lived in Delray Beach. <laughs> and and I, I called him and he said, well, who's Richard Flint? I said, he's a guy who, who really wants to pursue a career in speaking. He said, why? <laughs> Why would you want to do this? And he gave me four Fridays in his life at breakfast for an hour each Friday. When I asked him what I owed him, all he said was this. Remember when you find those people who need you, be a part of their life. And that's been my ministry. That's been my ministry, Joel. And I do this every single day of my life. Uh, you know, Richard, I'd like to say that there's four things that I caught in there and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like guidance, truth, self-realization and affirmation really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But that was the purpose for each of those men to be in my life at that time, because if they'd entered at another time, I wouldn't have been ready for them. Mm. Woo! <laughs> All right, my friend, we're going to have to get ready to wrap this up because uh, whew, this is deep. I, I would love to have you back on the show again. Oh, my God, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. So the third question then that I had from, for you earlier was, you know, um, what is it that you're doing now? Well, what I'm doing now is I'm investing myself in so many different ways. You know, with COVID, the world of the world of standing on stage speaking shrunk. And I'm still doing a lot of live presentations, but we've moved a lot to what we're doing, Joel, to the internet. We do a every Friday at 10 a.m. We do an open mic session that's open to everybody. It's free to everybody. And all they would need to do is go to richardflint.com backslash discussions and they can join our Friday family. And then we're doing small group retreats. You know, our next one coming up is on um, controlling your procrastination habit. Procrastination is probably the number one dysfunctional behavior that people have in their life. And we're actually going to do it here in uh, Palm Beach Gardens at the Marriott there. My small group retreats are limited to 15 people. And they're not me talking, me laying out questions and the group. It's the most interactive thing that we, that we do. Uh, and then we do a once a month virtual seminar uh, that uh, this next six months, our theme is on letting go. And this Friday, we're going to talk, we're going to this come on the ninth. We're going to talk about what does it mean to let go? And then each month for the next six months, we're going to talk about letting go of fear, letting go of doubt, letting go of distractions and letting go of being dysfunctional. And again, it's all on the it's all on the website. And if people would go to richardflint.com, they can see everything that we're doing. And Joel, my ministry, my purpose, what I want for people is to be better, to be smarter, and to be authentic. And if God's given me one gift, it's the ability to take what looks confusing to people and show them the pathway to finding clarity the learning center there. We opened this two years ago. It's my own online university. And we're, we're getting ready to release now a master class. That's only for the 2%. We've opened it up. I've already rejected about five people who wanted to become a part of it, but they're not ready for it. I interview everybody personally. And if I don't think you're ready for me, I'm not gonna let you be part of it because I don't want to be part of your confusion. I want to be part of your clarity. Confusion is a living life at a pace you're not prepared for. And, you know, and if people have questions, Joel, I don't mind. Richard at richardflint.com, reach out to me. 
And if you have any questions about what we do or how we do it, Richard at richardflint.com. Please go to our website, richardflint.com and take a look at what we're doing and become a part of this journey that we are, we're on of finding the 2%, helping people to become better, smarter, authentic, and live your life from the inside out and stop living from the outside in. Let go of the fear of being unique. Love it. I love it. Richard, man, I have enjoyed this conversation. I think that you are dynamic, that you're amazing, man. And I 100% support what you're doing. Please link up with me on Instagram. And I'd love to, if I can find you there, I know I got your information that I would love to uh, just link up with you and make sure that I give you a little salute on the social media if you have any anything there but I 100% support what you got going on. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Joel, I would love to come back with you and talk to you and your listeners about life's five greatest questions to finding your path. I think life is based in five questions. And I would, I would be honored to come back. Perfect, perfect. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? My three words, just understand behavior never lies. You're the essence of your behavior, not your words. Beautiful. Richard Flynn, everybody, please check him out. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Uh, that was like chicken noodle soup for the soul. And I really hope that people will dive into that there was some very deep conversations with inside of this program today and i just i pray and hope that people will dive in and take a listen to and you know reach out to richard flint seminar uh seminars and see what he's got going on you know behavior never lies is that is huge you know because no matter what we're saying inside of our mind our actions always seem to speak much louder than those things in our mind and the words that we say. So remember that in the words of Rich uh, Flint, behavior never lies. And remember this also, as much as it starts with you, it starts with me. Peace. <laughs>